Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so happy you're here. My name's Hannah on the channel. I post a lot of anti-MLM content. As always, I'll link a playlist right here and down below. This is my big anti-MLM playlist. All the videos I've ever created on this topic are going to be there. Zeke is here joining the party. Most of my videos have cat cameos in them. And if that content does interest you, I would love it if you would consider subscribing, consider liking this video. Those things really help to support my channel and I appreciate you so much for doing that. Today, I'm bringing you another MLM horror story video but before we do that I feel like I have some explaining to do maybe you noticed maybe you didn't but the thing is I have not uploaded anything in two months the last time I sat down in this room in front of my filming setup was July those videos went up the first week of August and I've disappeared since I did however upload a video a couple of weeks ago explaining the situation but if you did miss that video the news is I am pregnant <laughs> this is something that is beyond exciting for me. I'm over the moon. This is something I've been planning for and really wanting for a while. The one thing I did not plan for, and I feel just so naive about it, I completely underestimated how much my symptoms would hit me like a freight train and how they would completely knock me out and prevent me from living my normal life for about nine weeks. I always vow to keep it real with you guys. It has not been fun. I've been extremely miserable. Just this bone crushing fatigue. I sleep all day long. I've been so sick. I've had all the food aversions, all the nausea. I'm out of breath constantly. I feel like I'm on the verge of gagging constantly. It's not been a good time. But of course, the flip side of that is that this is something that I'm so grateful for. I could not be more excited. Becoming a mom is the only thing I've ever wanted to be for as long as I can remember. But with that excitement and joy has also brought brought with it a lot of discomfort and a lot of really challenging days. And it became apparent to me very quickly that I needed to just step away, take care of myself, rest, recover. And at the time this video is going up, I will be in my second trimester. I'm already feeling a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. I have like one good day and then two or three bad days. One good day, two or three bad days. But overall, I am feeling a little bit better than I did even a few weeks ago. So I'm feeling very hopeful that things are gonna turn around for me soon. I'm gonna be feeling a lot better really soon and I'm excited to be back and filming finally. And I think Zeke is excited to be back too, huh? So that's what's been going on. That's why I took a little bit of an unexpected hiatus. I really was not prepared for how hard that was gonna hit me and for how much time I was gonna need to take off. But I'm back, it's time to get back to the regular content. I have no plans to go anywhere anytime soon. Being here, creating content, getting back to work, this is all really helping me feel a lot like my Self again and I can't wait to just get the ball rolling and get back into it so let's do it and finally before we read these stories I do want to tell you about the sponsor of today's video Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that I have raved about several times on my channel it is the perfect place to discover explore and experience new scents just for you with Scentbird you get to choose a designer fragrance every month and a 30-day supply of that fragrance gets shipped to your door forget this only $17 you are in control of what you're ordering so there's no surprises. Scentbird has perfumes, they have colognes, they also have unisex options from designer brands like Prada, Gucci, Versace. And what I love the most is that you're getting a generous amount of fragrance to try for a very affordable price before you commit to those big expensive bottles. Now here's the part where I get really excited, okay? This is like my third or fourth time working with Scentbird, I believe. I didn't think it could get any better, but I was wrong. I was really excited to open my box this time to see their new and improved packaging. I I love the way this looks. My favorite part is that rather than the vial sliding into the tube, it's magnetic. You can open it up this way, secure it to close. There's a little lip right here so that your vial is not gonna fall out. It's not going anywhere. There's also this new locking feature, which makes me feel extra confident throwing it in my purse or in my luggage. This month, Scentbird sent me five new fragrances to try. And without a doubt, this is my favorite batch I have ever gotten. We have DKNY, Dolce & Gabbana, Confession of a Rebel, Versace, and Burberry. But if I had to pick one to be my favorite, I would pick Versace Bright Crystal Absolute. I mentioned in another video that they sent me the original Versace Bright Crystal, and that has remained my supreme favorite fragrance until Absolute came along. I was reading the description cards between the two, and it looks like the Absolute has notes of raspberry. It makes all the difference. This is the one to beat. If you would like to build your fragrance collection, you can visit the link in the description box below 
and use the code Alonzo2 at checkout. This is gonna give you 55% off your first month at Scentbird, available in the US and Canada. Thanks again, Scentbird, for sponsoring today's video. Now let's read some stories. This story says, hey Hannah, I'm writing this with a cat in my lap, so I hope you read it with your cat as well. Both of my cats are right here on the bed. They are joined in on the fun. My story is about a cousin who is in Mary Kay and is so committed that her wedding revolved around it. Buckle in because this will be long, but I promise it's good. A little backstory, my dad is seven of seven. All his brothers and sisters got married and had three to four kids. The grandchildren total is 23. Six out of the seven brothers and sisters stayed in our small town, so almost all the grandchildren grew up together. We had lunch together one Sunday a month, so we were all pretty close. You can imagine the weddings were never ending once my cousin started coming of age. Each wedding was like a reunion because everyone would be invited and we would get to hang out like it was a Sunday lunch. I have a lot of fun memories from those events. My family is also very religious and conservative. If you weren't in church on Sunday, grandma would call you Monday morning to ask where you were. Things like divorce, sex outside of marriage, and drinking were taboo. Our family held weddings in the church and focused on God. The receptions were highly tame with no alcohol or dancing, for the most part. A few had first dances and father bride dances, etc. One of my dad's brothers married a woman, let's call her Betty, who sold Mary Kay. So it had been part of our family ever since. She never pushed the products on us or tried to recruit us, but we all considered her the crazy aunt. <laughs> Betty and my dad's brother had three kids. The oldest, let's call her Chloe, is eight to nine years older than me. And the middle child, let's call him Brent, is four to five years older than me. I think, I totally can't keep track of everyone. Chloe used to babysit my siblings and I occasionally. She was a pretty fun babysitter. This story is primarily about Chloe. Because our family is so big in size and age range, most of my information about my older cousins is secondhand. From what I understand, Chloe had trouble working in a corporate setting. I never heard the reason. But that was the excuse people made when she started selling Mary Kay. My aunt said Chloe needed to be the boss and control her job, so she signed up to sell makeup. Fast forward to 2014 when it was Chloe's turn to get married. She had been selling Mary Kay for a while and had gone through a few boyfriends before meeting her fiance, let's call him AJ. Great, love that name, that's my husband's name. <laughs> the wedding took place in Des Moines, Iowa, about an hour away from our small town. With a beautiful outdoor landscape, Chloe picked a pretty pink for her wedding color, so the ceremony was filled with pink roses. The ceremony was short and sweet. The pastor led them through their vows, helped Chloe and AJ exchange rings, and she pronounced them husband and wife. Before the reception began, an announcement was made that there were designated spots for cars, a certain type of car. Six pink Cadillacs were lined up front and center at the reception, dare I say, in the background of the festivities. The reception, also outdoors, was beautifully decorated with roses, but the color against the gold tables now suspiciously resembled the same Mary Kay pink. I included some pictures that I found on Instagram. My favorite is the line of Cadillacs. I'll put some of those pictures here. Here's the Cadillac picture. This is the backdrop of the outdoor wedding. Fantastic. Here was some signage from the wedding. I'm covering up the names and photos, but it says wedding this way, pink Cadillac parking this way, <laughs> kind of directing traffic. And here's a few pictures of those floral arrangements with the pink roses. But that wasn't the main topic of discussion at the reception. Someone thought that the pastor had parked her pink Cadillac in the designated area. The gossip was that if the pastor was actually actually a pastor or if she was a Mary Kay consultant. And if she was a consultant, if this woman was directly above Chloe or her mom, could you imagine having your upline officiate your wedding? Interesting. Sometime during the reception, Chloe gave a little thanks for coming speech. Though she didn't pitch Mary Kay, she did say how much it changed her life. Imagine an awards ceremony acceptance speech, but instead of thanking family, friends, God, etc., Chloe thanked Mary Kay. I mean, the more details you're given, the more this is kind of turning out to be a little bit of a Mary Kay type event. I don't know why else people would choose to showcase the pink Cadillacs and to make that their wedding color and to make their wedding speech all about Mary Kay. Like that's just strange, is it not? I was working on YouTube at the time of my wedding. Could you imagine me getting up there and being like, thanks for coming, I'm so happy for this day and thank you to YouTube for all of the opportunities. Like what? It's just odd, like who does that unless you're in an MLM and you potentially have some kind of underlying ulterior motive. Maybe you're trying to flaunt all the things that it's given you or show off the kind of lifestyle you can have to your wedding.
wedding guests for some weird reason, like you want them to join you, I don't know. It's not normal behavior, that's all I know. Needless to say, my family wasn't impressed, especially my grandparents. Not only did the wedding not revolve around Christianity, but it revolved around Mary Kay, an organization that is supposed to be a Christian organization. The wedding made it obvious that Chloe put Mary Kay above everything else, her religious beliefs and her family. And this makes me kind of sad for her in hindsight because she's choosing to incorporate this job, this business, this opportunity, whatever she thinks it is, into one of the biggest days of her life, right? Odds are she's not gonna be a Mary Kay consultant forever, but she is gonna have these memories and these photos and this experience to look back on and it will forever be associated and intertwined with this company that most likely represents such a tiny little piece in the grand scheme of her whole life. If I'm remembering correctly, there was also a story similar to this that I've read before of somebody making their whole bridal shower or their bachelorette party or something like that all about their MLM and kind of turning it into a recruitment pitch. And it's just sad to think about truly because statistically people do not remain in these companies for any serious length of time, certainly not for an entire career. And even still on these big momentous days of your life, why are you incorporating your job? It's just so bizarre to me and truly sad. When I say that most of my information about my older cousins is secondhand information, it's more like all of my information. I wasn't invited to this wedding, nor were any of the younger cousins. My family got the invitation and it only had my parents' names on it. They thought it was a mistake until they tried to RSVP and they couldn't add me or my two siblings. My parents went to the wedding and reported this information back to me. They said our big family was in the minority. Most attendees were Chloe's customers and fellow Mary Kay consultants. My parents suspected the younger cousins weren't invited to make more room for pink Cadillac wannabes. Their impression was Chloe was throwing a Mary Kay party, not a wedding. That is fascinating because I know that a lot of people will kind of like leave out children of a certain age and younger from their wedding. Some people choose to have adult only weddings. Weddings can be extremely expensive, especially when you have large families. I get it. Some decisions have to be made. Some cuts have to be made as awful as that is. But you do kind of have to wonder in this situation if they were prioritizing certain types of family members who may or may not be more likely to buy into this dream that she's trying to promote at her wedding. Very fascinating. Though I wasn't extremely close with this cousin, I was upset that I wasn't invited. Though I was single at the time, I loved weddings. It had always been common courtesy to invite the extended family, and this wedding was the first time that not everyone was invited. I have since forgiven Chloe. Now I understand what an MLM can do to a person. I understand the cult-like mentality and that it's not her fault. After getting married, Chloe and AJ moved to Texas. AJ got a job at a call center, but his real job was Chloe's assistant. My mom said the move was because Mary Mary Kay needed more support there. Chloe is currently in Arizona for the same reason. I always assumed she was doing something right because Mary Kay relocated her more than once. But when I said something about it to one of my older cousins, she said that Chloe still calls Brent, her younger brother, to ask for rent money. Chloe does this so often that Brent's wife told him they couldn't help her anymore. Maybe I'm just not familiar with this, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but this whole idea of Mary Kay relocating somebody, I've never heard of this before. Maybe it's true. Maybe it is a thing. I'm not sure. Until this point, I don't think I've ever heard an account of somebody in an MLM moving locations, moving themselves to a different state for their company or for the company themselves to pick you up and move you. Maybe that could be the case with Mary Kay. I have no idea. Please let me know if you do know. Mary Kay in particular, I know that they like to operate more on an in-person level versus on social media. They don't really dip into the social media realm very much. So it would make sense to me that if you are someone who is going out in your local community and you're not having any luck or everyone you know is already a Mary Kay consultant or whatever, it would make sense for you personally to make that decision to move to a quote unquote less saturated area. But I have never heard of a company going pluck and plant, you're gonna be working here now because you are not employed by Mary Kay. You're an independent contractor. You work for yourself technically. For tax tax purposes, you are self-employed. I find it really hard to believe that the company or the corporate office would have any control over where you live. I'm gonna be looking into that a little bit more after I get done filming this, because that's very fascinating. I've never heard it written.
written that way. And I have no doubt that it was conveyed to you that way, but I'm wondering if the truth was stretched a little bit. And maybe there were some other reasons for those moves and why they decided to go to Texas and then to Arizona. One thing I do know is that the cost of living is much lower in those states. That's a huge reason why people choose to move to Arizona or to Texas, but I'm not fully sold on this narrative that she's telling you that Mary Kay as a company made that decision for her, like a business move or something. It's a little fishy to me. This older cousin also told me that her pink Cadillac had been taken away, but you won't know any of this from her social media, of course. It's still filled with Mary Kay products, pink Cadillacs, and other luxuries. Chloe and her mom have been in Mary Kay so long that the brainwashing is just part of their personality now. I see them at Christmas with the occasional Sunday lunch, but not enough to reform any sort of relationship, which is okay because now we are so different, a relationship wouldn't be beneficial to either parties. I still hang out with the cousins my age and we have a great friendship. Thanks for all you do, you're a blessing. Very interesting story, I like this one a lot. I've never heard of anybody turning their wedding into somewhat of an MLM pitch. Maybe not outwardly, but come on. The pink Cadillacs, the speech, the selective guest list where you're prioritizing people in your downline and upline over your actual family members and you're conveniently cutting out anybody who wasn't old enough to join Mary Kay, the wedding colors being pink, all of it. It's a little too coincidental to be a coincidence, you know what I mean? And I am sorry to hear that it sounds like she lost the Cadillac, she's moving around all over the place, and that she's still in this company. It seems like there may be these little signs that things aren't going as well as she's portraying on social media, and that breaks my heart for her because she deserves so much more than that. And we can only hope that someday she'll come to that realization too, but I can also imagine that it's really hard to get yourself out of something that you have intertwined so intimately with your life. You had a Mary Kay wedding for God's sake. Like the longer people stay in these companies and the more they allow it to infiltrate them as a person, their personality, the events they host, their big life milestones, the harder it's gonna be for that person to step away. It really is a sinister cycle and it would break my heart to think that maybe she does wanna get out but she doesn't quite know how or she feels as if she can't because of the sunk cost fallacy, which is a fallacy that you've invested too much of your time and money into something to be able to leave it, which is a fallacy because yes, you've invested this much of your life into it, but you're going to waste so much more time and money if you continue to stay. At some point, you just have to cut the cord. But I do understand that it's a really challenging decision for a lot of people and one that they slowly have to make over an extended period of time and kind of come to terms with it on their own. We can only hope that that is in her future and that she can leave Mary Kay in the past. This one says, hi Hannah, I recently stumbled upon your channel after watching anti-MLM content on YouTube. Looking back, I remember my mom going to a couple of these parties in our neighborhood. We lived in the suburbs of Chicago. I didn't start diving into the anti-MLM arena until years down the road. My story happened a few years ago when an ex-boyfriend, let's call him Eric, reached out to me wanting to reconnect and catch up. Because our breakup or relationship was neither tumultuous nor heartbreaking, I was open to the idea of meeting up for drinks and a walk down memory lane. He knew I was enrolled in university and was a mass communication and media studies student. And I delved a little deeper into how I wanted to end up in marketing and that the business world fascinated me. The conversation and drinks kept flowing and before the night came to an end, he told me about a book that changed his perspective and helped him learn a lot about business. He told me to write down the title and try to read as much of it as I could before we met up again. I should have been suspicious of his motive, but I agreed, although I had no intention of actually following through. And we went our separate ways for the night. A week later, we met up and he asked if I had a chance to read the book. I told him I was busy between work and school and I hadn't found the time to do so. He seemed disappointed, but insisted this book would change my life and to read it as soon as I got the chance. I didn't want to read it, but I wasn't going to tell him that. So I again said, I will try. The next time we met up at a bar and he said something along the lines of, you're really smart and ambitious. I think you should come with me to this business seminar I'm going to this weekend as my date. I think you'd really enjoy what they'd have to say and it could possibly help you in finding a business opportunity after you graduate soon. I had no reason to say no at the time. My feelings had come back and he was asking me to be his date. I was sold. I think this is the first story I've read where the emotions of something rekindling with an ex is kind of playing into this. Apparently that's a whole new way to suck somebody into going to an MLM pitch. I was advised to wear business clothing. So the next day after work, I stopped at the mall and bought some heels that would be more appropriate than the ones I already owned. I was ready for what I thought was a great opportunity. I showed 
show up to that place that weekend, and as I walked in, the room was filled to the brim with a bunch of enthusiastic young people. He leads me to his seat, and we wait for the seminar and speech to begin. A few minutes later, a man walks onto the stage, and the crowd goes wild with cheers and applause. This unfamiliar man was apparently important, so I just went with it. He started by telling us his story. Of course he did. That's how every single MLM seminar, recruitment meeting, Zoom call, anything MLM related, you always start by telling your story. Why? Because you wanna try and connect with people on that human to human level really early on. And you wanna paint the picture for them what is possible with this opportunity that's going to be pitched next how he came from nothing, and now he has more than he could ever ask for. Private jets and designer suits were his life now, and he was going to tell us how to do it too. The only problem was that he never actually said anything. He said so much, but didn't say anything at all at the same time, except that his 20-something-year-old children were retired and never had to worry about money again. I love that you're pointing this out. It's a word salad. It always is. It's a whole bunch of motivational fluff without any tangible tips inside. They can't ever give you the tangible tips because if they did, they would just have to say, hey, the goal here, recruit the most people. That's it. That's the only tangible tip you can offer. And boy, that sounds like a scam, doesn't it? So we're going to avoid that topic. We're not going to give the tangible tips. We're just going to talk about private jets and beautiful suits and retiring your children and never worrying about money again. Okay, that's the good stuff. That's the stuff people want to hear. People don't want to hear that it's all about recruitment and that it's kind of a scam. So we're just going to avoid that part, right? The part where I could not continue to be enthusiastic or supportive of his message was when he said that getting an education was stupid and to not fall for the false promises that college would promise you. As a woman who had higher education instilled in me as a child, I started getting critical of everything this man said after that. I'm glad I did because at that point he started talking about how his business opportunity was along the lines of and bigger than Amazon. <laughs> I didn't know what company he was referring to at the time, but I knew at that moment that I was being sold on an MLM fallacy. After the crowd applauded and gave this man a standing ovation, we all separated with the person we came with and we were asked to discuss joining this opportunity. And that's when our objections and questions would be addressed. The guy I came with started talking to a friend and the friend asked what I thought. I was fed up, so I told him immediately that I was confused, but nonetheless, not interested. I will never forget what he said to me. He said, quote, well, don't you want to be a good mother? Don't you want to have the time to actually get to be with your future family while providing them security and your attention? I responded that I never wanted to have kids, and then I asked him why my future has to revolve around family. I may be a female, but I'll be damned if I'm expected to be put into a role just because of my gender. His friend continued with his blatant disrespectful and sexist comments until my ex noticed I was uncomfortable and we left. Yeah, I hate all of that. Hate it. Hate it so much. <laughs> Completely agree with you that not every woman wants to be a mom. Not every woman wants to have a family. And even if they do, not every woman wants to be home with their kids. <laughs> hate to break it to you. They don't. It's perfectly acceptable for a mother to want to have a family and to also have a career. And that doesn't make her any less capable or loving of a mother. And just the fact that his first rebuttal to you when you say you're not interested is, well, don't you want to be a good mom? Don't you want to stay home with your kids? That tells you all you need to know about the culture and the expectations and the rhetoric that is spewed within these companies. And it gives you a little bit of insight as to why women are targeted so heavily, much more so than men. And it all lies on this foundation of the sexist idea that the woman should be home with the kids and that jobs outside the household are for men only. I think the argument can be made that MLMs in that way are extremely sexist in their culture. As we walked to my car, I straight up asked him, this is a pyramid scheme or an MLM, isn't it? He just said no and that there was no pressure to join. I went home and I started doing my research. I was angry that I wasted my time and fell for everything. I didn't hear from him after that and I still haven't. Once everything sunk in, I realized what I was being sold. I was lured into an Amway event. That's when I started watching anti-MLM content and learning more about MLMs in hopes to never fall for something like this 
this ever again. Not only was my ex never interested in rekindling things with me, he was using me to recruit me. How could I be so naive? Thank God I never read that book. I think it helped me to not become brainwashed by this lunatic that was promising these poor people an abundance of wealth. Thank you for what you do. Sorry for the long email. I hope this company burns to the ground. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope it burns to the ground as well. And yeah, your story has an interesting component with the person who's kind of trying to recruit you being your ex. That adds this whole other emotional layer to it because it's not just some stranger inviting you to some random event. This is someone that you've cared for deeply in the past and they're kind of framing it like, come and be my date for this event that can help further you in your career. All of that sounds fantastic, right? So I can imagine how much more of a gut punch that probably felt after the fact. This story says, hi, Hannah, I've been binging your MLM horror story series recently, and I never thought I had a story of my own to share. I grew up in a small Midwestern town, so MLMs have always surrounded me, although they had never really been a part of my life, as no one I actually knew was a part of one. However, in a previous story of yours, I heard the name Origami Owl, and an old memory of mine hit me like a truck. Before I get any further, I must mention that I will be talking heavily about S and depression. And while this story I believe is extremely important to share, it's going to be a rough one. When I was just moving into high school, I had signed up to be a part of my school's marching band. This meant that a week before school started, we showed up for band camp where we would learn the basics of marching and began learning our music for the year. It should have been pretty standard. Since I was a freshman, I didn't know anyone there, but I was quickly given the news that a well-liked senior within the band had passed away during the summer. Although I did not know him myself, I felt awful for all the seniors and other students who showed up every day full of grief for their friend. It was honestly heartbreaking. However, despite the devastating loss, the band continued to trudge like normal for the most part. That was until one of our evening practices about halfway through the week. About an hour into the night, we were all instructed to sit down on the field as a woman with a large bag over her shoulder came out onto the field with us. No one had any idea what was going on as no one had even told us that anything was happening that night. Then she began talking about how sorry she was for our loss and how there's always help out there for us if we should ever need it. At first, I found this really touching as someone who at the time was struggling heavily with depression myself, I remember the warm feeling I felt as she spoke directly to our hearts, telling us how strong we were and how important life was with us in it. Then she reached down into her bag and pulled out what she described as a quote, small locket to help you remember how loved you are. And then the real pitch began. She began describing each part of the small piece in extreme detail. And while I can't remember exactly what she said about each thing, I do remember this. I'm going to pause the story right here. I'll put a picture of what origami owl charms look like on the screen. I think this will help you visualize a little bit better what this is. They have a product called the living locket, and it's essentially just an empty chamber that you can put little charms into. And honestly, this is a really cute idea. I wish that origami owl was not an MLM. They have the most adorable little charms. They all have their own little meaning and you can customize them and swap them out and keep them in your locket. She explained what each charm inside the locket meant love, strength, etc. She talked greatly about the exterior of the locket and how she had chosen one with a gemstone exterior special for us. She encouraged us to keep the lockets by our side at all times and to keep them safe. She mentioned that we could reach out to her to have our lockets attached to a necklace where we could quote, keep them near our hearts. They did not have a necklace attachment already on them. And as I never followed up with her on that offer, nor did anyone else, I have no idea if she would have charged for it or not. If you thought she'd be done here, you are sadly wrong. She began talking about about her business in even more depth, explaining all the different options she had for her custom jewelry and how great of gifts they would make. Not only was she targeting us with this pitch, the grief-stricken teenagers, by explaining to us that she could help us create jewelry that could express our feelings, but also targeting our families by encouraging us to talk to them about the experience we had that night. After what felt like an eternity, she finally wrapped up her pitch and began passing out the small lockets. We were all told to line up and she passed them out to us one by one directly giving each kid a smile as she went by. Each one came in a small mesh bag and inside with the locket, of course, was a business card. Despite how weird of a feeling I had gotten from the woman's speech, I did end up keeping this locket for a while. I carried it in my pocket and would fiddle with it in the palm of my hand from time to time. However, looking back with the knowledge I have now, what that lady did was absolutely vile. Exploiting the unaliving of a promising student to pitch her jewelry to a large group of their grieving peers. I'm glad I was never swayed by this free gift and feel good men 
message to give her a sale, and I hope that nobody else did. I know that locket sits somewhere in a drawer now, and I'm sure I've long since thrown her business card away. I'm in a much better place now, and I'm glad I can see that memory for what it truly is and how predatory the whole situation was. Thank you so much for reading this and keep doing what you're doing. Hindsight is 2020, isn't it? There are so many stories I get of people being like, wait a minute. I see this experience from my past in a completely different light now that I know what was actually going on. And on one hand, I do feel like it was kind of sweet of her to come and to give this little talk and remind all these kids like times are tough, but you're not alone and it's going to be okay. I think that's a great sentiment. And giving the lockets as gifts and leaving it at that would be one thing, but she took it a step too far in my opinion by offering the business cards, giving a little pitch about how great this would be as a gift, encouraging people to turn it into a necklace and potentially charging them for that, that kind of thing. That's where it does cross that boundary for me into that predatory kind of nature. What starts out as a seemingly harmless, kind, thoughtful gesture is then tainted by this pitch, by this opportunity to try and sell something. Because while it was a nice thought and a nice gesture to begin with, there's always that underlying ulterior motive. And there kind of has to be. When you are in an MLM and your goal is to sell a product or recruit people, it's like a switch flips in your brain and all of a sudden everyone you come in contact with is seen as a potential. A potential customer, a potential client, a potential downline member, a potential to make money in some way or another. And apparently that includes, like you said, grief stricken teenagers at band camp. Clearly nobody is off limits. And it's really sad that I almost feel trained now these days to look for the ulterior motive in every action of an MLM rep. That's really sad. I wish that I could just take their actions at face value and accept it for what it is, but it's never actually what it seems to be. There's always this underlying ulterior motive to it. And pretty much in every case, that ulterior motive is money. And I think that sometimes people in MLMs do things like this to somewhat justify their behaviors because they're able to kind of blur that line a bit and they're able to see it more as like, well, I'm just helping someone. This was a kind gesture. I was trying to make a difference in someone's lives, right? That's what you can tell yourself to sort of overshadow the true fact, which is that you're trying to make money off of people who are grieving over a very sad situation. I'm really sorry to hear that this happened to you. Unfortunately, I'm not the least bit surprised. And thank you for pointing out how something can happen to you years ago. And now once you kind of learn about the anti-MLM movement and all the information that has to offer, it makes you look back on these experiences in a totally different light. Thank you for taking the time to send in this story. This story says, hello, I recently discovered your MLM horror stories series and they've been fantastic to listen to while I've been at work. Thank you so much for what you do. I lived in Utah my entire life and was Mormon until I was 18. So needless to say, I've been thoroughly drenched in MLM content my entire life. However, my story goes all the way back to middle school before I knew what any of these schemes were actually about. I went to a very small private K through eight school and my graduating year of eighth grade had four, yes, four people in it. I never had any friends my age, but the only other girl in my class, we'll call her Annie, was always pretty sweet to me. We bonded over the Twilight books. Yes, we were 14 right when they came out. And I actually found myself going over to her place a few times to hang out, a complete novelty for me. It was wild. I had a friend. As summer was coming up our last year of middle school, Annie and I were laying in her backyard with our shirts slightly pulled up, sunbathing as best Mormon kids could. I remember her rolling over and touching my bare back. Oh wow, you've got a lot of acne on your back. I was a teenager, so of course I was mortified, but she really wasn't trying to be malicious. She followed up with, I used to have a lot of it too, but my mom sells this really good acne treatment at her work. Do you want to come with your mom and try it? I bet she's got samples. All to Annie's credit, I genuinely think she was trying to be a good friend. I don't think she really knew either what was involved in her mom selling Mary Kay. Cut to the next week and my mom and I are over at Annie's house getting makeovers from her mom. I hated it. I hated dressing up. I hated anything that felt pretty or traditionally feminine. But if this was going to help my breakouts, then fine, I'll sit through it. My mom ended up buying some lip products for herself and an assortment of Mary Kay's Velocity line of products for me. I have no clue if they still sell those. This would have been like 15 years ago. To their credit, I really like the smell of it and I still have some scent spray from ages and ages back. Goes to show how much I actually used it. 
but the acne treatment simply did not work. <laughs> I felt really, really bad having to tell Annie that my mom wasn't gonna buy anything else from her mom. There were no hard feelings, but over time and transitioning to new schools, we gradually grew apart. I still think of that sales rep sometimes. She was the first person to tell me about being able to earn a car from her work. A pink car? They come in pink? Amazing. Knowing now just how insidious those car payment promises are, I honestly really hope she and her family are doing okay. This is my first run in with MLMs, but far from my last. Living in Utah is simply wild. Thanks for taking the time to read this, you're a rock star. Something that I'm noticing from your story is that you were a teenager, your friend was a teenager, and as you already mentioned, she probably had no malicious intent whatsoever in being like, hey, you seem to have this problem and I have a solution for you if you would like to try it. I'm sure that it was coming from a good place and to some extent, I'm sure that in her mind, this was also kind of somewhat normal, right? Like my mom sells this, this is her job. She has these products and they solve these issues and I can refer you to her if you would like to try them out. And at surface level, it seems very harmless, but the way that I kind of see it, like the frame that I put it in is how crazy is it that we have young people, typically young girls, who from this age are somewhat prepped and primed to think of MLMs as something completely normal in our society. And women join these companies and they sell these products and they make it their job. And I guess the shift that I would be hoping to see in the future is to start having young people become more aware of what these schemes are and to not be looking at them as just another thing that we have and just another path that I can go down as an adult and just another career that I could have. Because not to say that every child of an MLM rep is going to grow up and become an MLM rep themselves, but I think the more normalized it is in the adult space, then the more normalized it becomes for those people's children. And then they take it to their friends at school, to the people on their sports teams or their clubs or whatever it is. I guess what I'm trying to say is that your story is making me hopeful for a future in which young people are equipped with the knowledge that MLM companies are scams and they're money-making schemes and that it becomes less normal for us to be supporting these things. How great would that be for this to kind of play out in another way in which a young teenager is pitched an MLM product to cure or solve whatever ailment or insecurity they have and they themselves can stop it right there because they are equipped with the knowledge they need to say, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. I don't support that business model. I've done some research on my own. And the conversation ends there. You never go to the party. You never try out the products. You never waste your money on things that don't work. You never unknowingly support this really insidious business model. That's kind of where my mind goes as I'm reading your story. Because it appears to me that people are getting pitched MLMs younger and younger. Here you are. 14 years old. And I think we could really make some strides towards making MLMs a thing of the past if we start to educate even younger and younger. They're getting pitched younger and younger. So why are we not informing them younger and younger to be able to protect themselves? Definitely some food for thought. Thank you so much for sending in this story. This story says, hello, Hannah, my husband discovered your channel maybe two weeks ago, showed me a couple videos, and now we're both hooked. I did not know that the anti-MLM community was a thing, but what a vibe. <laughs> You're in good company. My mother got involved with Mary Kay for the first time back in the 80s, but I'm not 100% sure. She even met Mary Kay Ash personally. Lots of Mary Kay in this video. Unintentional. I'll do a better job of mixing it up next time. She still had old products in our house. We did not use them while I was growing up. So I remember Mary Kay kind of always being around. When I was around 10 years old, my mother got back into it and being a little girl surrounded by makeup, I thought it was so cool. I even tried to help my mom sell product and succeeded a couple of times. Let's be real, I was a little kid and no one says no to a little kid. To be completely honest, I never understood growing up why my mom never stuck with the business and succeeded. She never bashed MLMs, but I think in her mind she was thinking what we all know now. Funny how this is coming up again, young children of Mary Kay reps or of MLM reps in general, seeing this as a totally normal thing, a totally viable business opportunity, a totally normal way to make money, and why didn't my mom stick with it? That's so weird. Personally, I think we should be normalizing how MLMs are scams. I think that's what needs to be normalized here. Trigger warning, mention of depression and substance and alcohol use. Please understand that I'm not trying to be a crybaby. I'm just trying to paint the picture that MLM companies prey on people who feel like there's nothing left to lose and who just want to feel productive. 100%, that's something I preach all the time. Fast forward to 2020, because that year was like hunting season for MLM companies everywhere. I'm 20 years old at 
of the time I had just gotten married and my husband was gone at basic training for the army. The whole world was basically in hibernation and I was depressed. I was unemployed, self-medicating, and felt like a zombie most of the time. My Mary Kay recruiter, who was at one time also my mom's, was a close family friend and reached out to me because I had mentioned that I wasn't working and I wanted to be doing something. Even though it didn't work out for my mom, I knew she did like the product and I thought that she would think it was cool that I was getting into it. My recruiter helped me set up my account and order my starter pack, which was a little over $600. Product, customer signup sheets, that month's catalogs, tote bag, etc. My husband supported me even though he thought it was a bad idea, bless his heart, because he just wanted me to be happy and to do what I thought was best for my mental health. And this right here kind of begs the question, if your mom was not in Mary Kay, would you have been this open to this opportunity? Maybe, totally possible. I completely agree with you that 2020 was like the perfect breeding ground for MLMs to thrive. Lots of financial panic, lots of people wanting to stay in their homes, lots of people not wanting to go out into the world, go back to their normal job. Maybe you have kids at home and they're being taught online now and they're not going to school and you have to be with them. There are so many perfect storm situations here that allowed MLMs to explode like we've never seen before. Everyone wanted quick, easy cash. Everyone wanted to work from home and people who were already in MLMs at that time benefited beautifully from recruiting all of those people based on those fears and vulnerabilities. But anyway, back to the point. I have to wonder if Mary Kay, if MLMs, if this kind of business opportunity wasn't normalized for you in your childhood, I wonder how that would change your susceptibility to getting involved with it as an adult. In my personal experience, I had never really had any firsthand encounters with MLM companies until I was in college. And at that point, I was kind of already set on my path. I wasn't really looking for other opportunities. And so it made me a little bit more skeptical and I looked into them a little bit more. And that's how we're here today. <laughs> but yeah, I often wonder like, what if my parents were in Amway or something? I would just see that as a child as a totally normal path that people go down. And I would probably consider it a little bit more heavily as one of my options in my future. And don't get me wrong, people of all backgrounds and situations and life experiences get sucked into MLMs, but I think that'd be a really fascinating study to see the likelihood of people who had that childhood exposure, how much more likely they would be to join an MLM in their adulthood. My upline, who was also my mom's, we'll call her Leah, told me to send all of those hey hun messages so I could set up my first virtual party. A town near where I live had just flooded and one of the women's cabins was ruined and required a lot of work. She was one of the women that Leah wanted me to text. I told Leah what was going on and that it didn't feel right to reach out to sell makeup to someone who was currently devastated over her damaged home, right? Completely logical. She told me to do it anyway and present it as a quote, I know you're going through a rough time, so let me pamper you type of thing. Cue the eye roll. I ended up texting this woman and as suspected, I didn't get a response. Three years later and I still feel horrible forever pressing that send button. A great example of doing something that you probably wouldn't otherwise do and that your moral compass is telling you isn't right, but you do it anyway because that's what you're told you have to do if you're gonna make the MLM work for you. For about four months, I put on a full face of makeup two to three times a week and attended weekly meetings. I sold four to five products to my mother-in-law and aunts and I recruited one person. It was also getting so overwhelming and exhausting not making money and being pushed to work all the time. Of course, I received multiple motivational texts like, yes, you feel sad, but keep going so you can succeed. If you're not committed, you clearly don't want this bad enough, etc. I told my recruiter and upline that I was done. My recruiter tried to persuade me to stay, but backed off after a couple of texts and phone calls. My upline sent me one text a month about reactivating my account, and after I ignored her a few times, she eventually stopped texting me and unfriended me on Facebook. I spent over $600 to start, and I made a little over $160 overall. The only two nice things I got out of the whole ordeal were a cute bee necklace and a pair of earrings, which I ended up giving away anyways. Sorry that this was a lot, but I hope what you learned is that no matter how low you feel or how financially in need you are, that MLM is not the way. Go to therapy, surround yourself with good people, and get hired for a real job. You're not lazy and you're not worthless. MLMs are just 
corrupt and greedy. Thank you for your channel and for showing me that I'm not the only one. Keep up the good work. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic takeaway that no matter how down in the dumps you feel, please do not join an MLM because the odds are not in your favor that that's gonna bring you out of that hard situation. More likely, it's gonna dig you deeper down in the dumps. What I'm reading here is that you basically wasted four months of your life and you lost over $400, all for something that was promising you the exact opposite. People join MLMs on hopes and dreams when the reality is most people that do join are only fulfilling the hopes and dreams of the people in that upline, the people who are making the most money off of you joining. I completely agree with you. MLM is not the way. Thank you for sending in this story. And with that, my friends, it's all the stories I have for you for this video. I recognize that this might be a little bit shorter than you're used to. However, this took me like twice as long to film as normal. The number of bathroom breaks, snack breaks, water breaks, the, oh, I might be sick breaks. It means that I didn't get to as many stories as I wanted to today. It might be like this for a few more weeks weeks until hopefully I can see the light and feel a little bit better. But thank you for being here. Thank you for bearing with me as I took that huge break. I don't plan to take any big breaks like that anytime soon, but I really appreciate that you came back to listen to some more stories when I did return. And before you go, don't forget to check out Scentbird in the description box below and use the code Alonzo2 at checkout for 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I'll see you in my next one real soon.